Hey guys and welcome back to a new video and a new episode of Philips Android News. I don't know who of you still knows the former Philips Android News, but so many of you wanted me to bring it back to my channel so that I just take some time once a month to collect all the important information that affect us Android developers, no matter whether that's something new from Google, something new from JetBrains, Kotlin, uh, some changes in Android Studio. I will take all these changes once a month, put these in a five to 10 minute video here on YouTube. So you really also only have to spend these five to ten minutes once a month and you really know what's uh, what the changes are out there in the android world so this would now be january's edition where i talk about the changes that happened in december and the first thing we need to get into is jetbrains fleet because jetbrains announced a new ide which is currently in preview state and jetbrains fleet is really meant to be kind of the VS Code of JetBrains, which is meant to be on the one hand very lightweight, so it it starts immediately, there is no real delay. It is meant to work with a lot of different languages, so it's kind of a, a single code editor to do it all. And you can try this out at home already by downloading the free public preview, so it's a preview version. This is definitely not optimized. But just to quickly go over what the main differences are, why you should use JetBrains Fleet, we can on the one hand see that it makes it easier to collaborate with other people. So something like this was already possible, but with, uh, with some plugins in Android Studio or within other JetBrains IDEs um, called Code Together, But Fleet can really be directly integrated into a cloud environment so that you and a company maybe have one central project where all developers are working on. So it's all distributed via the cloud. That is optional, of course, but that is one big thing this new IDE brings. Other than that, if we keep on scrolling a little bit here, you can see some features. Um, it advertises a lot that the auto completion is better. So I think in this case, it's pretty much the same engine. As you can see, the, the same code engine as also powers uh, IntelliJ, Android Studio. So the auto completion probably doesn't change a lot if you're an Android developer, but uh, this compares a lot to VS Code, where the auto completion is a different one. And as I always said, it's distributed for flexibility, so it's designed to support a range of configurations and workflows. And we can, e we can either run it on our machine, or we can also move this whole thing to the cloud, as I mentioned. If we keep on scrolling a little bit, we see all the languages that Fleet currently supports. So you can see that is a broad range of languages, definitely more than you can use in Android Studio by default. So it's also meant to be used more like VS Code that you have maybe some scripts you need to edit quickly, or especially for front end work, which isn't really, really heavy work, which you can save quickly, where you can see changes quickly. But you can also write heavier project with Fleet. That is at least how JetBrains advertises it as the single tool for any language. And I've tried that out for you. And as you can see, I get a lot of errors if I open an Android project here for you. I don't know what I did wrong. Of course, that's in the preview state. So you can expect that this already works with uh, any type of project really well. Uh, but for Android, because of all these unresolved reference issues, which I wouldn't have if I would open this in Android Studio, because of these, it makes it pretty much unusable, at least in the preview state. Um, so I don't know how I get these away. Sometimes I'm lucky and uh, if I relaunch it, they are gone, then they reappear. So something doesn't seem to be optimized for Android at least yet. But that is also what my feeling is that I wouldn't use such a lightweight IDE for Android development, which is kind of a heavy technology or this uh, relies on heavy functionality inside of the IDE. So things like the profile or the layout inspector, then you have emulators, then building an Android project is also a lot more complex than just um, opening a website and its changes. So for these heavier things, I'm always a fan of using an IDE that is really specialized for these. And that exists, that is Android Studio. But in and of itself, Android development seems to be supported because uh, we can also launch this app here, then everything will work just fine. And I'm pretty sure for other technologies, and especially for front end, this will work much better. So if you are a fan of JetBrains IDEs, if you're a fan of their auto completion, of their tooling, then I think you will really like Fleet, but I think time will show how it really compares to VS Code, which is already quite established in the market. Next news is we finally have a Kotlin plotting library, which is called Candy. I think this was really missing in Kotlin that we have some kind of easy way to create graphs like this here. In a simple way, that is also Kotlin idiomatic, we can just create a plot here, create some bars, and then have uh, real data, which really is, is completely independent of the UI here, by the way. So 
this code does not re involve anything UI specific, which is also very interesting for Kotlin multi-platform, where we could just have the, the plotting logic in our shared logic section of our code base. And then we can use that on both iOS and Android or even more platforms to display our graphs. However, right now we can't use this with Android yet, so there is no direct compose support. Instead, this library really only considers creating the, the raw data for these plots, but there is not yet a way to take this data and display it in our Compose UI. However, as I understood it, they are already working on a solution for that. Because right now, Jetpack Compose is really missing a good an official plotting library, because I don't think there are any good ones. So this was just a simple example here on their GitHub, but they also have some more complex examples, as you can see here, which creates really nice graphs, depending on what you want to visualize. Um, if we keep on scrolling, you can also see some different variations of that. So depending on what you what kind of data set you want to visualize, I think this library will be a big help. Coming to the next change, and that is Gemini. Google announced that new AI model, and I think this is really the most important change in December. So Gemini is Google's direct competitor to GPT-4. If we keep on scrolling, you can see that they also compare it here which shows that Gemini seems to be a little bit better than GPT-4, but that performance isn't even the special thing about Gemini. The special thing is that it's optimized for on-device usage. And it's really easy for us Android developers to use that in our own apps, just in form of a library. And I've already done that. I have built a little AI app in just 30 to 60 minutes. In case you didn't watch that previous video, you can find it here, click up there after watching this news video, of course. But let's see in which variants Gemini comes. So it on the one hand has an ultra model, a pro model and a nano model. The ultra model is you can see the most capable one, the largest model for really complex tasks. Then we have the pro model, which is currently the only one that is available. So that's optimized for a wide range of tasks, as you can see. And then we have the nano model, which is the exciting one here, because that will be used directly on Google's Pixel devices in future. So we will have an on device AI model, which works completely offline which can assist us in our daily use of our smartphone. So I think future will show how creative Google can become with that new on-device AI, but I think it really has huge potential. And personally, I think at this point, this new AI isn't a big difference to GPT-4, but what I really like about this is that it makes AI more accessible for us developers. Because so far, if you were an Android developer and you weren't much into AI, into AI models, into TensorFlow, then it was a little bit hard for you to implement AI functionality in your Android app. But with the Gemini, that now changes because it provides a really developer-friendly API. And I've also used that API in the video I just linked you above, where I really implemented that and also showed you code examples how easy it is to integrate this AI functionality into your apps. So in the end, you can really use it like a ChatGPT button code. And as the last piece of news today, Google also announced a new Android system service together with this AI Gemini. And that system service is called AI Core. This is a service that is only accessible on the Google Pixel 8 Pro device as of now, but it will make the integration of AI simpler in future for Android apps. So all in all, it just allows you to have an easier management of your AI models. It has some safety features and just provides easier access to AI models like uh, Gemini Nano. And that's already it for this episode of Philips Android News. If you are currently learning Android and you would like to take your skills to the next level and learn things that are really relevant for the industry, check my premium courses down below to have a really good start in 2024. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye bye.